Go, Randy. Okay. Greetings, stormwater professionals around the country, maybe the continent, for all we know, the world. Um, welcome to part two of a stormwater pond webcast series uh, presented by the National Municipal Stormwater Alliance. We call ourselves NAMSA. My name's Randy Nieprash. I'm the vice chair of NAMSA, and I'm talking from uh, the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Next slide, please. So here's what we're gonna cover in this webinar today. We're gonna to do a, an introduction, a very brief overview of NAMSA, and an overview of our draft stormwater pond decision framework that we're gonna want you folks to take a look at, please, and offer us some feedback. We have a panel of presenters to discuss ponds as assets, challenges related to ponds aging, managing ponds as public assets, and then um, a discussion of a specific pond asset management application. After that, we'll have time for questions and answers. Um, we'll have a discussion as part of that as well, and then we'll wrap up. Next one, please. Our speakers today, there's me. I'm with Stantec Consulting, the Minnesota City Stormwater Coalition, and the National Municipal Stormwater Alliance. Uh, Don Green with the National Stormwater Center. Trey Shanks with Fries and Nichols. Uh, Robert Potts with eSciences, and also Seth Brown, who is the executive director of NAMSA. Next one, please. This, uh, as I said, this is a series of webcasts. We did the first one last week, and here you can see the URL uh, where you can access that. It was a discussion of po problems with ponds. Today, we're talking about ponds as assets. On October 7th, we'll be talking about new technologies and ponds, and then finally wrap things up with uh, the MS4 perspective on stormwater ponds in general. Next one, please. Some housekeeping. Uh, this webcast is being recorded. A recording of the event and a PDF file of the slides will be made available to everybody. Uh, you've given us your email addresses and we'll use those to distribute those. Uh, PDHs are available. Please send Seth a request for those. Um, we're asking attendees you're all muted, um, and we're asking that as you have questions, please type them in using the question function in the GoToMeeting control panel. Um, please send te technical, technological, any questions you come up with uh, as we go through, again, through the question function. You will see some poll questions as we go along, and we'll ask you, to respond to those quickly. We did those last week and the results were really interesting. And finally, not listed on this slide, you will see in the control panel that there's an item called handouts. And under that, if you open that up, you will see a link to a PDF file, which we suggest that you click. It will open up a, a PDF file in your web browser and you can save it from there. Next one, please, Seth. So I'm going to talk briefly an overview, big picture of NAMPS, of ponds in general as a new issue, a little bit of information about NAMSA, and then Seth is going to talk about a proposed stormwater pond decision framework that we would like you to consider. Next slide, please, Seth. So the big picture, we thought we knew and understood uh, most of what we needed to know about constructed stormwater ponds. They're one of our oldest types of best management practices. We thought they were one of the simplest. Um, we have thousands of them. We've counted them here in Minnesota. Our MS4 permittees have more than 14,000 constructed stormwater ponds. The estimate I've heard for the Chesapeake Bay TMDL is north of 60,000 for the entire drainage area. Um, all this information that we knew about stormwater ponds is still true, but now we have new information 
and we have both good news and bad news. Next slide, please. So we have some unexpected problems that have come up, and we talked about those last week. Um, interesting, important material. We also have some exciting opportunities where we can enhance the performance of existing ponds using some new technologies, some older technologies, but very cost efficient retrofits. And we'll talk about that in the webinar in early October. We recognize though that our ponds merit and need proper maintenance and management and should be viewed as public assets um, where an asset management system is appropriate and necessary. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Next please, Seth. In the webinar series, we're gonna present a number of ideas. We want to test them with you folks. Uh, so we're asking for your opinions and feedback, both during the webinar with your questions, but then also emails uh, afterward as well. We want to explore building a national consensus to move ahead with some options that are appropriate for stormwater ponds. And we want to explore this decision-making framework that may be able to help local implementers better consider their options and make sound decisions. Next, please. So just a bit about NAMSA. Um, who are we? We are a national coalition comprised entirely of MS4 permittees, almost entirely of MS4 permittees, and focused solely on issues and concerns rated, related to MS4 uh, permitting programs. Our members mostly are organizations and not individual people. We have two types of members, uh, state and regional coalitions of MS4 permittees, and then affiliate members, which I'll talk about in just a second. Our state and regional member organizations each represent at least five, in most cases, many more MS4 permittees in a state or a region. And our affiliate members can be any number of different types of companies, consultants, technologists, law firms, manufacturers, and others that are focused and involved in the MS4 sector. Next, please. This is a map of our state and regional coalitions. Uh, we did this last week and it's already out of date. Uh, this shows 20 members and we have two new states that just joined up um, last week. So Texas and New Hampshire should now be uh, colored blue and will be in the near future. Uh, you can see there's a nice distribution, uh, especially with Texas. We, we have virtually every, uh, certainly every EPA region and almost every geographic area in the country involved now. Next slide, please. And this is the NAMSA leadership. Um, Scott Taylor is our chair. He's involved in CASCA in California. I'm the vice chair in Minnesota. Jennifer Watson is our treasurer with the Tennessee Stormwater Association, and Dr. Brown is our executive director. Next, please, Seth. And with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Seth. Take it away. Okay, thanks, Randy. Um, one thing that we covered in the, the first uh, uh, webcast of this webcast series was a detailed overview of what we call a proposed stormwater pond decision framework. Um, and, and we call it a draft version because it was just a 1.0, it was a straw man. Um, I'm not gonna go through that in detail here. We don't, we don't wanna take up that same amount of time. Um, but the, the, if you go to the handouts area, that is the, the, the detailed version is listed there and a recording of the first uh, webcast is available and we'll send that, that link out to you. For some who've been looking for that, uh, we had to set up a new channel and that's just something we just finished. So we will get that out to everybody. But basically this, this is a, a, a framework that helps communities consider who are considering you know, addressing their ponds or wanting to address their ponds, how to move forward in, in, a, in a systematic way, a programmatic way. Um, so it's, it's, it's not supposed to be the be all end all. It's very simplistic. It's very, 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 uh, very much of a, a, a starting point and again, this is a, a current version, um, meaning that a 1.0 of an initial draft. So we're looking for input from um, from folks. We're going to talk about this, in this on this uh, webcast, and we're also going to um, ask you to provide input. 
these are the seven aspects of it. Again, there's a lot more detail, and I'm just showing the basics of it here, um, again, because I don't want to take up more time. But a lot of this comes from EPA's Fundamentals of Asset Management for water, um, the water sector. And also, I stole a little bit from Trey Shanks, who's uh, going to be going into this in greater detail. So I had to I have to tip my my cap if I was wearing one to Trey on that. So you'll you'll see more. It'll be it'll seem very familiar once you've seen um, Trey's uh, presentation. There are other uh, def decision frameworks. There's many ways of doing this out there. This is one I, I grabbed from Kitsap County in Washington State. Um, it's more of a flow chart, but it's a lot of the same type of uh, decision making uh, questions and parameters and pathways. So, you know, some questions that we're going to ask you is, you know, is this the way that we should frame this rather than the way that we framed it um, already? Here's another example. This is from EPA Region 1 from, uh, you know, New, New, uh, Massachusetts and New Hampshire, uh, looking at, you know, a, a stepwise approach to this, which is similar to what we put together. But again, it's it's a little bit different. This was talking about stormwater retrofits writ large, not just ponds, but. So, uh, and I'm not gonna go through all these questions now. We'll send this PDF out to you so you can take a look at this at your leisure. Um, but these are the kind of questions we'd like to, you to consider when looking at this framework that we've provided um, as we move forward. And the question is what to do now. So again, you can download the document under the handouts area in your, um, in your GoToWebinar uh, box there or app. And um, you can do that anytime. You don't have to do it right now, but you, you can do it sometime soon. Look at the information and, and consider the questions that we talked about in the last, uh, in, the, in the previous slide. Email them to me, Seth Brown. And uh, if you can, if, if you could, so I can help to organize the input here in the, in the, the, the subject header, put in comments on Pond Decision Framework, that'd be great. We will look at this information, all the input, and then we'll make a, a final draft. We'll make that freely available on the NAMPS website. One thing that I should note is that this is being brought to you by the Chesapeake Bay Trust, who is uh, who are the underwriters for this um, effort overall. Um, so we'll have some focus on the Chesapeake Bay, of course, but we'll also have a national perspective um, as well. So with that uh, said, I wanted to, to, to kind of reintroduce the speakers here, and I wanted to, to clarify, we see uh, two Randy knee crashes when Randy is, um, when he's back on. Um, Don, if you can if you can wave to everybody so everyone knows who the real Don Green is, there's Don Green. So he's the real Don Green for those who know him. He's going to be first uh, kicking us off here, and he'll be talking about uh, pond inspections and O&M, kind of a, a lot of visuals, if I remember right. So uh, Don will be begin, uh, kicking us off on that. Trey is going to talk about kind of a, a general approach um, to asset management, specifically looking at ponds. And then Robert Potts will be fo uh, focusing on an application uh, that Florida DOT um, has kicked off recently called the Stormwater Asset Management System, or SAMS. And I think PONDS are the first that they've they've looked at. So that's that's the order of things. Before we get going, I did want to um, uh, send a quick poll out to just to see who's who's um, who's on board. So we're gonna launch a quick poll here and ask everybody to uh, vote and let us know. Um, what your affiliation is. So we'll give you, uh, this should be a, hopefully you know who you are. So hopefully, hopefully should, this should be a quick one. And uh, we can just see who's on board. Um, it's, it's, it's helpful as we have discussions um, to know who's joined us today. So I'll wait a minute or two in order to do this, to get a good percentage. And the hope is that the, the silence will, will help those who are remaining that have not voted yet. Okay, so I'm gonna close this now. We have a pretty good idea of what we're looking at here. And it looks like we have uh, a significant number of folks that are um, from the public sector, which is great, which is really nothing against the private sector. Um, but it's um, it's good that that's really what our intended audience here is, is the, the folks that are program, uh, stormwater program managers, really. This is what we, um, we're intending. So it's great to see you guys on board. So I appreciate you taking your time and other uh, public sector folks. Is, it's great to see you here as well. Okay, so with that on, in uh, in mind, we're going to uh, move over to Don. Don, are you ready to to kick things off for us? 
Ready? Okay. All right. Let me just make you the the, the panelist. Yep, we got it. It looks good. And Don, um, you want to give a little bit of your, your okay. own background too? I, I didn't I didn't do a lot of that. So if you want to do a little bit of your background, that'd be great. Yeah, I need to move some screen so I can see what I'm what I'm doing. Let's see. I'm not Randy Nesposh. Um, I'm Don Green. Um, here's who I am. I'm a I do uh, do some instruction for the National Stormwater Center, but I also work part time with uh, W.K. Dixon. I'm a senior water quality consultant, and uh, as you can see, this is some of my background. I've been in the environmental field for almost 40 years, and um, started out as a biologist and with a non-point source program in Tennessee, and I'm still working with the Tennessee Stormwater Association. I was president, and and uh, board member, uh, stormwater coordinator with the phase two, and worked for the phase one MS4 for the city of Chattanooga for 10 years, which I just retired from. And you see over here, this is what we do things for is with a family, for, for my family. So I'm uh, my expertise is in, in, um, in inspection and maintenance, I set up the inspection and maintenance program for the city of Chattanooga for 10 years and oversaw that. So. I'm going to be looking at inspection and maintenance of ponds and what we see out there. And uh, as we start getting this, we're all I'm focusing towards MS4s. As we can see, the uh, the fifth uh, minimum control measure uh, is uh, post construction. So we're looking for post construction, permanent construction, and what we need to look for when we're looking for at ponds and detention ponds. And uh, of course, EPA recommends. Uh, the post-construction structural and non-structural will be appropriate for local communities, minimize water quality impacts, attempt to maintain pre-development runoff conditions and require adequate long-term operation and maintenance. Because uh, what we're, we're looking at inspections and uh, here's a detention pond that, this is a dry detention pond, but it's plugged up. Uh, we want to make sure that we track in our database either a spreadsheet or a proprietary database but uh and this is is the detention pod first thing what do you look at is the detention pod still as it was designed so how do we know that let's look at the as built let's look at the plans you got an inspection maintenance agreement uh with the inspection maintenance plan uh, are we looking at structural is it structurally sound or do you have sediment build up is it a nuisance I get used to get calls all the time. You know, there's a tension pond here that's got rats and snakes and and bats and whatever in it. You know, mosquitoes in it. Is it a nuisance? Uh, is it going to continue to be a problem in the future, even after it's maintained? And, uh, and the number one thing I look at is is it functioning? So let's look at um, what what is what to look for when you determine if a pond is functioning. What's the health? of that pond. So um, real quick, Google is a great asset to look at, uh, you know, look at the detention pond, look at other water quality structures you have on the pond, as built. If you have an as built, uh, jump into it, you know, look at the, uh, look at the, where it's going, where it's been, look at the elevations of it. Um, yeah, a site map. So here's a site map a plan for this detention pond. Uh, look at the inlet structure. Look if it has a four bay. You know, know what you out have, what you have out there uh, to begin with. Look at the outlet structure. And this is something that a lot of people do not really look at. Is look at where it's discharging. The discharge of a detention pond is very important. If you have a, a regular side view or overview of it, that would be great. That make some plans do, some do not. Um, find a picture of when it was finally approved. Hopefully your MS4, um, when the when the tension pond is approved, you take a picture of it and document of, of what it looks like. Because if you come back to it, it's all grown up. It may be very difficult to tell exactly what that pond is supposed to be looking like. Hopefully you have an inspection maintenance plan that says this is the 
This is the uh, infrastructure you have out there, and this is when it needs to be inspected and maintained. If you have a, a list of things you're looking for, like this, this basic um, list is, you know, uh, does it have debris and trash? Check the outlets and inlets and make sure that it's, it's the water's not standing there. Do not use pesticides, herbicides. Uh, make sure the grass is still is is mowed high, not like a lawn. Um, is it got problems with vegetation? And then here again, here's a schedule of inspections. Hopefully you inspect it quarterly. Uh, and uh, and every five years, especially. And if you have a checklist, here's a checklist for bioretention. If you have an intention pond checklist, that would be great. Uh, inspection form for for the third party. Uh, so you know that what you what you want, um, and here's a real quick look at the inspection form that I do that shows the pond, it shows inlets and outlets, and shows a potential problem you see down here at this inlet structure with uh, some sediment uh, erosion problems. So um, so real quick, I'm going to walk you through. This is an inspection of this detention pond I did about two or three years ago. It's a video. There's no sound on it. If you hear a little sound, don't worry about it. But first thing I do is, is walk out there and look at the, the banks of it. Uh, looks like that this, uh, this pond has been mowed very low into the ground. We need higher vegetation, higher grass, four to six inches, keeps the weeds and the trees from coming back. It also uh, puts those, that uh, root system in the ground further um, to make sure that the that your, your the grass is holding, make sure there's no erosion. Look at the banks, make sure that we're not getting any animal holes in it if we're not getting any erosion problems. Then the outlet structure. This outlet structure looks pretty good, it's maintained. Uh, this section here looks like it's got some potential erosion. You might want to document that to make sure because sticks in time saves not, of course. Look inside the outlet structure. Looks like there's, there's really no. Um, very little sediment leaving this. So there's a potential problem. You document that, you know, stabilize that so it doesn't cause a, a large problem in the future. That's kind of minor. Uh, continue to walk. This pond has three inlets. So the inlet structures look to be maintained pretty well. Uh, got some ripper out there. There's some, uh, this is done in January. So we have grass that's dead or some weeds that's dead. Make sure they're not putting pesticides or herbicides on this, and here's a potential problem. Here there's water standing in this uh, this inlet structure. I went on the other side of that, there's no water coming into it, so not sure where this water is coming in. If you have a test kit, you can test for chlorine, uh, determine what that, why that water is standing there. So this pond looks pretty good. So those are some things, there, there's no trash there, uh sediment there's no sediment buildup you can see erosion problems is it a nuisance no uh, potentially i'm going to show another pond in a few minutes that could it be a nuisance so one thing i also want to look at is it, where's this pond discharged to so that's something um here's the pond we looked at a lot of times you don't look at the discharge but i always want to try to look at the discharge so this is a discharge from this pond it's kind of a unique discharge. It comes out, goes back into some some pipes. But this is a discharge from that pond, and it looks it's pretty pretty well maintained. Uh, there's not really sediment coming out, not any erosion problems. So uh, these are some of the things I look for when I do an attention pond inspection. So let's let's go on. Um, again, is the pond still still as it was designed? Is it functioning? So um, what do we got next? Why do we need to do proper stormwater maintenance? Because we're looking at infrastructure. And I'll, as all of you know, that infrastructure is a big buzzword nowadays, but we have as much in a lot of cities, as much or more infrastructure for stormwater system as we do for wastewater. And so maintain that, to, to maintain the asset, to know what asset you have, know the age of it, know the pre when it needs to be replaced is very important. So uh, here's a real quick go look at a detention pond. This is a detention pond. 
Uh, that's the inlet structure of the tension pond. Uh, looks like it needs to be, you know, it doesn't, it's, they're not maintaining it normally as normal, well, well I don't know what normal is anymore, uh, but, uh, but this needs to be mowed. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of um, weeds growing in. This is that inlet structure. Again, we've got some potential problems at this head wall. So if this is not taken care of, this could, could come into a, a, a large problem of what it is. So here's the outlet structure of that pond. Again, uh, you got a tree starting to grow there. Trees are very important to make sure that to a lot of people want to eliminate trees from the tension pond, especially on field banks where the where it's been filled in. So um, so there's a tree growing there. The keep trees at least you know 50 feet away from those from the outlet structure. Um, this is a detention pond in uh, Franklin, Tennessee. This is a dry detention pond. It's been clogged and it's had enough water coming in that it's. it's it's about to overflow. So this is can be a, a major problem in flooding and uh, and problem with the detention pond. So uh, here's a, another detention pond, has several inlets, one outlet. So we're gonna look at the, the outlet structure. Uh, it looks good. There are trees growing on, they were planted there. Uh, they, it's very stable. So I don't think those trees are causing any problem. So let's look at the, the uh, outlet structure it has a small orifice uh, it has some riprap it looks like it may be clogged but i think that's just leaves so so this pond looks pretty pretty good um, again this is a uh, well-maintained pond and um, so again let's look at one that's not been well maintained here's one uh, that i looked at so this is the outlet structure this is a dry detention pond so it's got some major problems. It's this um, weeds has a lot of cattails. I know a lot of places look at cattails as as being acceptable, but this is unacceptable in my opinion because of the potential problems these cattails actually clogging up vegetation is clogging up this outlet structure. So um, so and and coming into it, there's a outlet inlet structure that's got some erosion problems. So they maintained it after I sent them a letter and, and went through a process of enforcement and developing an enforcement protocol is very important for MS Force too, to make sure that you have the backup and you have, you know, the lawyers and everybody's keyed in to knowing what kind of enforcement you're going to be uh, applying and how it's going to be scaled. So this is, um, this is after maintenance, looks like they've continued to have some, uh, some cattails growing here. So could this, these cattails continue to grow? Could be, is it gonna be a nuisance in the future? Could be, uh, I would like to have grass growing here with the cattails. There's another picture of it. This, this side also has a head wall problems with um, potentially problems. There it is uh, at this inlet structure. So the infrastructure, the head walls, the outlet structure, all that is very important to check here's outlets pond discharge it has a tree growing there this could be a potential problem with this site uh, another we we see a lot of trash in these detention ponds here's one i inspected just the other day uh, about two or three weeks ago and uh people love to it's the tragedy of the commons you know it's a it's a hole let's throw trash in that's where it belongs or or the wind brings into so this could be a potential problems a problem so make sure that uh, maintain for trash pictures can be deceiving when you have a inspection and maintenance requirement this picture looks like it's it, uh, a really good pond maintained there's the outlet structure there's an the inlet structure there's the outlet structure there's another outlet structure and there's one but this is what one of the outlet structure looks like one of them does it looks like it's pretty well clogged uh this is a far one on the right as you look at this has vegetation and it's it's um so you need to get up close close and personal these these structures to know what's going on and the outlet structure looked pretty good you can see it's 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 not eroding away and it's 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 pretty well open and free so here's a detention pond a very flat detention pond doesn't even look like a detention pond 
uh, you can see the some uh, an inlet structure up there. Uh, this is something I see all the time. Is this is a, a a sediment pond, but the sediment pond is going to be converted into a uh, detention pond in the future. So make sure that um, that these detention these sediment ponds have been uh, the outlet structure has been uh, retrofitted back to the detention pond, and uh, so you won't have problems. Again, discharges, discharge areas. This is a very unique discharge. Here's a very good discharge. This is a discharge. Um, landscapers may not understand the water quality concepts. <laughs> Here's a swale that is a, a ditch swale that's going into a detention pod. Looks like the, um, the, the staff decided they didn't want to get down in there with a mower, so it looks like they herbicide this. This could be a big problem with uh, sediment uh, moving off site going into the pond. So make sure that the, the swells, the inlets are very well maintained. Um, stay away from pesticides and herbicides and, and make sure that it's stable. Um, real quick, a lot of MS4s in cities, I know the uh, phase ones in Tennessee, require to investigate all their stormwater flooding apparatus infrastructure and evaluate can they be um, can they be remediated can they be turned into water quality and uh, here's an attention pond that that, uh, that we that we went in and, and uh, cleared out but we left some trees because our landscape people said these trees are a good stormwater structure someone used to say Someone would say that storm, the trees are the number one stormwater uh, device, water quality you have. And, and so we left some trees. So here's another tension pond that was allowed to grow up. We went in and did a, a reclamation of it, remedial reclamation of it. But uh, unbeknownst to us, the staff said, okay, let's put down some uh, matting and the plastic matting, we want to stay away from plastic. We have so much plastic in our system already. Uh, so we can use a lot of other mattings if you're going to put matting down, it's not plastic. So um, we're looking at infrastructure. We're looking at um, how to keep it maintained, how to inspect it, and to make sure that, uh, that we know what the asset it is. And we look at the, look at all the, the parameters to a detention pond to make sure they are main, they are going to be maintained and uh, public or private. So that's me. I'm Don Green, uh, National Stormwater Center, uh, NIPSA, and W.K. Dixon. Yep. Thank all you. right. Thanks. Thanks, Don. Yeah, and we've got some questions that have come in, and I think it's we can address some of these at the oh, at the the Q and A at the end. So okay. I, I I encourage folks, I'm gonna take the screen back from you if I can. Please do. Okay. And um I'm gonna kick off a, another poll real quickly too. Uh well, there'll be a couple one of these after each one of our presentations. It's just good to get some input from, from all you folks. This is as much um we're looking for engagement as much as just uh you guys just sitting and watching what we're talking about. So just launched another poll and asked to um characterize your experience on, on some of the pond problems and challenges that Don just presented. Um, is this stuff entirely new? Is it, um, are these uh, relatively new? Just love to see um, if it's if it's common to address these or, um, or not. And like I said, for folks out there, there are going to be, we'll do two more of these. So um, just want to give you a heads up uh, so that you can be ready for it. And while this is going on, actually, let me, uh, Don, if you're still um, if you're still on there, maybe I can ask you a quick question while we're getting um, information in. I am. Um, okay. There's a question about cattails, the pluses and minuses of that. I mean, can you take... Um, 
take advantage of that as as far as evapotranspiration is a good thing, but it's um, invasive in many instances. Do you have any quick thoughts on on that? What what when I look at cattails, I see a lot of problems with potential clogging. As you saw that detention pond, it was clogged up by by vegetation. That vegetation came from I'm not sure where it started, but uh, but the cattails have made it worse. Uh, they also will create, you know, they they live and they die, and they create kind of micro pools uh, where the where the most of the pond may be um, may be clear, but these micro pool micro sections micro uh, elevations uh, where maybe vectors can form. Um, they they can be a problem. Uh, you know, I know that some municipalities look at them and say uh, they're an asset, but but after but they 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 may mask or there's no grass. You may have uh, some erosion problems. So you know, I, I like a clear you know lawn type vegetation, four to six inches, where you can really look at it pretty quickly rather than have to wade out into it. So you know. I guess there there are some um, some debate about allowing cattails. You don't. I don't know a detention pond that I know of a dry detention pond that was designed to have cattails in it. They come in uh, as you know it's part of the seed bank. Maybe uh, later on, if the water starts standing there longer than than uh, than several hours, several days. So right. Uh, okay. All right. Well, we'll have more time to talk about this some more. Um, sure. Don, I appreciate that. And I know uh, Robert Potts. I know that you uh, you guys deal with that in Florida, and there was some discussion, so maybe you can elaborate on that. So let me share real quickly um, the results of of the familiarity that folks have, and uh, it looks like um, it looks like there is. Uh, it's hard for me to see with the scale that I have on my screen. It looks like this is a relatively new or somewhat new uh, to most uh, folks, or, or at least familiar. It uh, looks like, in, in many instances, common practice. So it seems like this is something that um, a fair amount of you have seen before. Uh, I thought we thought it would be good to have kind of a, a, a baseline to go from when it comes to um, you know being on the same page, looking at pond challenges. And again, our approach and what we're talking about and what we put together in our framework was. Um, thinking about pond problems and pond challenges, and then if you can correct those, then you can enhance those beyond that to get maybe get um, additional performance, um, and then uh, use that for offsets or credit, or credit trading, something like that. Um, so anyway, that's that's uh, it's great to see. Thank you for that input. Um, and now we're going to uh, go to our next speaker, which is Trey Shanks with Freeze and Nichols. Trey, if you're ready, I'm gonna pass this along to you. Okay. And let me get that screen. Let me know when you're. Is that showing the right screen? Or am I showing myself? Nope, I don't see a screen yet. Hmm. Let's try that one more time. How about that? That's it. You got it. Go Excellent. It. Okay. Appreciate it, Seth. Um, that's actually a, a really good survey question you just did that's um, may frame a little bit how I approach um, what I'm going to talk about with you guys. Um, just real quick, my introduction. My name is Trey Shanks. I'm with Freeze and Nichols. Um, I'm uh, based here in Texas, um, but as a company, we kind of work over the um, south and southeast, um, over North Carolina, Georgia, uh, and Florida as well. Um, and my background is originally MS4, stormwater quality, stormwater funding and the like. And I'm, um, my, my current iteration of my career is um, focusing on asset management overall. But I've, I've got a stormwater bent to everything I do. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to be able to talk with you guys a little bit uh, today about that. Um, what I'm going to do is take a little bit of a step back from what Don talked about is just do stormwater uh, or asset management from a little bit of a 30,000 foot perspective and um, apply a little bit to stormwater ponds. And then um, I think that'll tie in well for what Robert's gonna talk to you about um, following this. Um, let's see if I can get my screen to go. 
there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna do two things. One, I'm just do a, a quick overview of what asset management is, um, just from the uh, standpoint of framing terminology, um, a mindset of how you go about making decisions um, that you make for what actions to take um, for stormwater ponds or any assets really. Um, so Don gave a lot of examples of different things um, inspecting for and uh, remedial actions for that. The asset management framework is helpful for uh, figuring out where to prioritize your limited resources to get the most bang for your buck. And then we'll talk specifically about asset management from a stormwater pond um, perspective. So let's talk cars first though. Um, okay, so what we'll do is do just a, a, a quick run through of something familiar to everybody, um, that's cars. Um, and we're gonna take this a family and their, uh, their cars. And so simply walk through the terminology of the different aspects of things. So for them, what, what do they own? What are they responsible for? They've got these four cars. That's simply their inventory, okay? So your inventory of, of your assets, um, okay? So that, that's simple, that's straightforward. You've all got, you got them for a reason though. So what's the purpose and the need of each? This actually is pretty important uh, when we get to the stormwater ponds. Um, that's the level of service. So, so for this, you've got the, the work truck, it's a family run business, um, you need that, no truck, no business, no money. Um, so that's, that's an important uh, you know, vehicle for uh, the family overall. Family hauler, of course, to get everybody around. You've got the old Wagoneer, um, classic old car. It's been reliable over the years, but it's getting there. Um, the teen car, okay? so a teenager, grandparents spoiled the kid, um, new little car there, it's in great shape. Um, so brand new. And then you've got your old uh, 55 Thunderbird that sometimes it runs, sometimes it doesn't, but it's always a fun thing to, to tinker with. Um, but you expect nothing out of it. Uh, so which of those are the most important? Okay, um, it's Some of them matters if they work, sometimes it doesn't. Um, so that the terminology of that is just criticality. Which ones are the most critical to provide the expected service for uh, those assets and for your infrastructure, okay? You know, like I mentioned, the work truck, you have to have that working. Um, it's gotta be reliable, you can't let it break down. It's pretty important, same way for the family hauler. You have gotta have it working to get everybody around. But you've got a little bit of redundancy here, that while it's not as convenient, if the Wagoneer breaks down, you could squeeze everybody into the teen car. Your teen's not gonna be happy giving up her car for a few days, but you can make it work. Um, so in a pinch, you've got some backup. So it's not quite as critical as the work truck because you've got some backup. And then the weekend cruiser, um, there's no there's no consequence if that thing uh, fails. It'll just sit in the garage for a little bit longer. It's what's been doing for 30 years anyways. Okay, so how are they performing? Okay, that's simply what the condition is. Okay, so for work truck, it's got some transmission issues. It's running, but you're starting to get a little nervous about that. The Wagoneers coming up on 40 years old. It is near its end of life. The teen car, brand new, it's under warranty. Uh, should lead, need very little maintenance. Um, just follow the manufacturer's recommendations. And by definition, you know, a 70-year-old car is um, always needing work. Okay, um, that's okay. That they are where they are. So, but from that, the condition and the criticality, you, you can get your framework to identify what, um, which of those assets do I need to prioritize um, my actions for? Uh, okay. And that's simply your, your risk assessment. So your condition and your criticality. So condition being your likelihood of failure, your criticality often called the, the consequence of failure. And, and those factor into um, you know, your risk-based uh, assessment. So given that your truck is highly critical and it's in fair condition, trending downward, it's a high risk um, issue. You've got moderate risk, um, pretty significant for the family hauler, and you've got low risk for your two small, uh, your, your, your teen car and your weekend cruiser. Even though the weekend cruiser is in bad shape, 
it, there's no consequence of it failing. So the risk is still low, even though it's in poor condition. That's important to be thinking of as you're evaluating stormwater ponds or really any asset is, yeah, it's in poor shape, but does it matter? Okay. Um, so uh, given that the teen car is in great shape, okay, um, and it's fairly low criticality, but there is some redundancy to it. So there's a little bit more um, of, of a higher risk if it fails than the weekend cruiser. Okay, so now you know where, where to prioritize your, your energy, but um, what actions do you take? Um, we often call it a decision tree. Um, you know, we know what assets we've got, we know what condition they're in, we know what they're supposed to be doing, um, we know which ones are most important, what actions we take. And this simply gets to your, your maintenance um, activities, capital improvements, you know, as necessary. So your O&M and your CIP, where do we invest our energy and our actions? Okay. So starting with the work truck, you need to keep that risk down, it's gotta be working. So uh, you're gonna take it to the dealership, to the professionals to get it serviced right, to keep that risk low. You're gonna take it before the transmission fails, make, her, make sure everything is working right. Okay. On the other hand, down the bottom right, the weekend cruiser, it's already failed, um, but you're not gonna take it to the dealership. That's your hobby. There's no consequence of it fails. So you're gonna do a little shade tree mechanic work, find some YouTube videos, um, that show you how to fix things and maybe, maybe not get it fixed, okay? The team car, um, it's under warranty, okay? So if it's still in its warranty period, it's best to follow the warranty recommendations, follow that schedule for changing the oil, servicing the, the car, um, do its routine maintenance um, according to that. Now, as often happens, Don touched on this, that sometimes the assets get old enough and degraded enough that it's time to um, decommission them, replace them. And that's what we do with the Wagoneer here. It's had its end of life. The cost of maintaining it and the risk, even if it's been maintained, is still too high um, relative to um, replacement. So it's time to sell this one and, um, and move on. Okay. And the whole reason asset management really exists is if we had unlimited money, we wouldn't really care about it. Um, how to prioritize things and what to go do first. So, um, but money is limited. And so we need to figure out how and when um, do we fund uh, these actions. So that's having a good financial plan. So as I mentioned, for the truck, repair, the Wagoneer, replace, okay? uh, maintain, it's under warranty, the, the, and then you know, rebuild, reconstruct components. Different cost aspects, identifying what's gonna cost to do that. How am I going to pay for it? What's the funding source? Is it coming from um, my own funds or the third party resources for it? If it's a private party, um, you know, then that changes the approach for it. And that over what schedule uh, am I going to implement those actions? Okay. So that's just the big picture overview of what asset management is, just using a, a familiar frame of reference of, of cars. Um, so let's apply it quickly to stormwater ponds. So the inventory part of things, you know, knowing what ponds you have, um, you know, throughout your service area, um, typically, you know, map those in GIS is, you know, um, typical approach um, for that. Knowing what types of ponds, are they dry ponds, wet ponds, um, the other types of structural control, you know, measures really. Um, you know, get those all mapped and characteristics, you know, of those, what attributes are they? Are they lined? Are they, you know, vegetated, um, outfall types and the like. It's really important to know the ownership um, aspect of the last three, ownership, access, maintenance, um, are really important components of those as, as you go along. Um, are they, you know, owned by your organization, you know, by your city, your MS4, you know, if that's what you are, or are they private, um, facilities that you're responsible to make sure that they're functionally functioning as intended. Um, so getting all that identified um, is a value for the upfront inventory. So level of service um, is next. What's the purpose of the pond? Um, you know, sometimes we get on um, a little bit of a siloed mindset 
of thinking, well, this pond is, and sometimes it is, only for one purpose. It's only for water quality protection or it's only for flood protection. Um, but it's very common for um, stormwater features to have multiple purposes um, for multiple people. So uh, in Texas, flood protection, detention ponds is one of the primary drivers and they're being retrofitted or now a, a amended to include water quality protection uh, devices. In other areas of the country, um, the water quality is the you know, primary focus and there's some flood protection benefit. Um, but there's also you know, other benefits um, as well from a, uh, the community standpoint or stakeholders in general. Um, so you know, part of the purpose may be to mitigate uh, discharge velocities, so you're minimizing the erosion in creeks downstream. Um, but there's also the community amenities, so recreational use, ponds and parks, um, aesthetic amenity, people, HOAs tend to you know, like to have um, their ponds be aesthetically pleasing. They end up being you know, a park amenity for the community. And then there's the environmental um, habitat aspect that um, in some ways can be good, some ways can be uh, a nuisance, but there's um, inherently going to be um, a tie in there. Some of the recreational uses aren't necessarily even for wet ponds. Um, you know, in Fort Worth, there's a, uh, a dry detention pond that um, is used for soccer fields um, when, uh, when they're dry enough. So, which, you know, around here is pretty frequent. So criticality, um, you know, do they all, are they all equal? No. Um, which ones are the most, you know, important? Um, are they, you know, which which of those stormwater ponds are, have the highest level of service expectation, serving the largest area, um, protecting critical infrastructure? Sometimes that may be, uh, you know, protecting, um, say, a hospital district or this background image shows for Atlanta that's going to be near, you know, um, you know an urban area um, with the um, stadium in the background. Um, that's a high visi highly visible um, feature that provides a functional benefit, but there's definitely a community aesthetic and an expectation of um, access and use for that. So knowing um, all the aspects um, of which are most important and why they're important is um, important to help where to focus your energy. From a condition standpoint, I think Don covered this well, um, knowing relative to your level of service, right? What the service expectation is for it, um, what's the condition you know, of it? Is it providing the function um, that's intended, okay? Um, very common sedimentation uh, for ponds, um, excess vegetation or inappropriate vegetation, improperly located vegetation. Are you getting bank erosion? You're getting um, degradation of the structure itself. Are your um, hard assets failing? The outfall, the head wall, spillways and the like. I think Don had some good pictures of that. Nuisance issues that could be um, anything from burrowing animals to ponded water where you're getting mosquito um, infestations, and then um, the the con constructed design. Um, you know, is it constructed as designed, and is the design and the construction meeting the current intended level of service? And an example of that, I'll use it from a flood protection standpoint, um, would be you know a a pond designed to protect for a 25-year um, peak storm. Um, but the current design standards are 100 year storms. Um, is that something there's an expectation to retrofit and upgrade to? Or it's designed just to provide flood protection benefit and now there's an expectation for it to provide a water quality protection benefit as well. Is there a retrofit or an upgrade necessary for that? And then also access. Um, that, that's an issue um, that if there isn't either physical access available or an easement um, available, uh, that inherently um, makes uh, it more challenging to inspect, assess, maintain um, stormwater features. 
so then these roll up to um, your risk assessment. Um, so just a simple graphic talking about what I mentioned before that, that risk um, being a function of the consequence of failure, the probability um, of failure, and focusing on those highest risk um, assets um, for your investment decisions. Um, and essentially one way to think of this might be that something that's high risk, you wanna take proactive measures for to make sure it never fails. Um, whereas something that's very low risk, low consequence, um, and, and even if there's a higher probability of failure, but if there's a very low consequence, it's not gonna cost much to fix it and there's no adverse impact of significance um, if it fails. That may be a, what we call a run to failure you know, type of um, scenario that when it fails, then we'll schedule to get it fixed. So we'll get out there, but um, there's, that's not something we need to spend time resources on up front because there's no great benefit for that. And then from uh, O&M CIP type um, aspect, the actions to take, uh, you know, whether it's vegetation management, debris removal, you know, fixing the, the hard assets, which the, the pipes, spillways, outlets, and the like, slope repairs. Very common one is, is dredging. Um, and this is something that I'm, I'm sure that, um, you know, most people on the call today have um, dealt with the challenge of, you know, privately owned facilities that have been constructed, you know, um, as intended, um, and they're maintained, and but but to that private owner, whether it's a homeowner association or a private property owner, uh, private business, that the expectation of maintenance, from their understanding, may be to mow it, you know, uh, every once in a while, um, you know, keep the vegetation in control, and a few thousand dollars a year uh, to take care of that. The reality is over 10, 25, you know, 30 years that sedimentation happens and the pond capacity isn't what it was and doesn't function as intended. And it is a very significant expense to dredge a pond. And uh, as, as many entities and many MS4s are struggling with now, um, the pond owner has no financial resources to pay for um, that uh, dredging to restore that condition. So you've got degraded service overall in the system. Um, and at this point, figuring out what is the solution to that? Are we using public funds for private property? There's no public easement on that property um, and the like. So these, these are challenges to, to work through, um, through the prioritization, but um, identifying you know, the riskiest assets and then prioritizing your actions um, based off of what type of need there is, is the O and and CIP component. And then finally, figuring out what is you know, the, the funding approach, as I just you know, touched on. You, you've got a specific solution that you've identified, um, and then to identify what is the appropriate um, approach and timing to make that investment action, whether it's an inspection, um, follow-on, maintenance activity, uh, you know, capital improvement, and are there, you know, is it something paid for by your own entity or are there third party resources that are more appropriate or that can participate in that? Something that's important, you know, and we're, at, you know, I think an asset management mindset is important to recognize is if the stormwater pond has multiple stakeholders, multiple interested parties, because there's this variety of services you know, going back to that again, they're expected. It's a, it is a pond amenity. It's a recreational feature. Those are the kinds of opportunities to widen the net of what funding sources can help pay um, for the maintenance and improvements to those ponds to keep them functioning as intended. So, you know, just to summarize, you know, benefits, you know, of an asset management framework towards taking care of your stormwater infrastructure um, are multiple and, and varied. So um, it will help with MS4 compliance. MS4 um, requirements actually, you know, dovetail well into an asset management mindset. 
um, more objective approaches, um, better business justification um, for the actions that are taken and lowering risk, improving performance, um, and minimizing the cost overall. Um, that's really what you're looking for with asset management is to balance your risk, balance your uh, costs um, with the expected level of service. That it's a constant juggling of those three actions or those, those three needs. And with that, um, have a good journey. <laughs> great, great presentation, Trey. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna take the uh, the, the 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 screen back um, and launch on the poll. And while I'm doing that, um, Randy, do you uh, Randy Neeprash, Do you have any uh, do you have any thoughts on or questions for Trey while I launch the next poll? Sure, I do. Thanks, Seth. Um, mm -hmm. So it would seem one of the benefits um, of having a robust asset management system for stormwater um, structures and devices might be um, on the regulatory side. Um, you know, I can think, uh, you know, it would be easier to track and report uh, BMPs that are in place to regulators. It'd be easier, uh, this might be the only effective way to actually estimate pollutant load reduction if you're working under a TMDL. Can you, can you talk a bit about the regulatory benefits of having a robust asset management system for stormwater? Sure. Yeah, um, that's a great question. The, from a regulatory standpoint, I mean, obviously, you know, starting fundamentally with the inventory of what you've got um, and being able to identify what the purpose, you know, of those facilities um, is to then identify what, um, when you're inspecting, why you're inspecting, you know, what per, you know, what service you're expecting, you know, from that. Um, there is a value um, that we've seen a couple different ways. One, um, from being a little bit more targeted with the uh, inspections to the higher priority areas, being able to group uh, types of um, efforts um, to maximize um, that that benefit um, overall, um, the we're, we're and then re, on the end game of things, uh, there is more and more of a push um, from a grant funding um, and uh, loan funding um, approach mm -hmm. that if you have an asset management program in place, that uh, for some states that it will bump your uh, score, you know, so give you a higher likelihood of getting the grant, um, or and alternatively on the loan, um, will provide a potential for a lower interest rate um, on um, a loan and even some debt forgiveness um, for that. So there's a whole variety of aspects from a regulatory compliance standpoint that it helps tie in with. You know, EPA developed um, a, a very good, straightforward asset management framework um, that's been applied on the water and the wastewater side for years and applies just as well on the stormwater um, side of infrastructure, so. Okay, great. Thanks, Trey, for that, that response. I wanted to, uh, we got about 65% of the folks have voted. Um, so hoping to get a few more to make sure that you guys see this. Um, we're asking about your level, you know, the how, how much your community or your organization, um, you know, how much how much asset management have, have you guys been involved with or have you seen or experienced? And um, want to make sure people get a chance to vote. We've been we've had this open for a while. Okay. I'll close this now, and 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 there'll be one more poll, and we ask for you folks to to remain engaged uh, on that. So let me see here if we can share this. It looks like uh, almost half uh, state that they're somewhat familiar and are planning to do something like this. Another third are very familiar and are actually applying this right now, which is great. One question I had for you, Trey, is. Do these responses, um, do they surprise you or do they, are they consistent with what you expect? 
Actually, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised to see that there's nearly 30% of um, respondents that are very familiar with it. Um, what we've seen is that stormwater has, you know, generally been a little bit of catch-up mode relative to uh, water, wastewater, roadway, public infrastructure, and others um, on getting going. Um, but it's rapidly um, catching up. Part of that is that that regulatory driver um, that's helping emphasize it. Um, part of it is um, seeing the payback that's happening by doing a little bit of investment planning on the asset management side, that the payoff for it is um, is, is clear. Um, and it's also helping from a communication standpoint to stakeholders, whether it's you know the community, um, leadership, you know, within the organization, elected officials, and the like. Okay. Thanks for uh, checking that out. We'll have some other questions that have come in, and uh, I know we'll discuss those in the Q and A session. And uh, and 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 um, you know we'll have one last poll, like I said. So thank you for continuing to do that. Thanks for the great uh, presentation, uh, Trey. I am going to um, close this poll, and then our next presenter will be Robert Potts with E Sciences. Robert, are you ready to go? I'm ready. All right. Well, I'm going to move this over to you so we can move on to the the last but definitely not least presentation. All right. Can you see my screen? Yep. Go for it. I'll All mute right. myself and go for it. All right. Very good. Um, thank you and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Robert Potts. I'm with eSciences. We are uh, an environmental and engineering firm um, located in Orlando, Florida. Um, I'm gonna be talking, as uh, Seth mentioned, on the FDOT, uh, Florida Department of Transportation's uh, recent uh, asset management system. They refer to it as uh, SAMS, uh, Stormwater Asset Management System. Um, I was gonna be presenting with Steve Peen with Applied Technology, and unfortunately he was not able to participate today, but. Uh, both eSciences and ATM are currently uh, working with DOT to develop the um, the SAMS application. And with that, um, give Robert, a little yeah, background it, about it, myself. Yeah, sorry, Robert. If you could if you could uh, put yeah. that into presentation mode, that'd be great because it'd be a little. I think it would oh, show a little bit bigger. Absolutely. My Perfect. Apologies. Thank you. There Thank you, you very much. Yep. Great. Yep. Uh, a little bit of back, uh, background about myself. I am, uh, again, a senior scientist with eSciences. I'm primarily involved in uh, water quality related issues, PMDL, basin management and action plan implementation, um, also phase one and phase two MS4 program uh, consulting for um, DOT uh, and, and local municipalities throughout the state of Florida. All right. So, the overall uh, approach with the presentation is to give a little bit of background of DOT, uh, FDOT, um, their historic approach with managing their stormwater data, uh, particular ponds is what we're, we're talking about here with this, um, with this panel. Um, so I'll start with talking about DOT. Um, DOT is actually separated into eight um, different districts. They are um, kind of deregulated or decentralized. Uh, there is a central office that uh, assists with management and policy, but effectively they are um, decentralized, each district. When it comes to managing their stormwater assets or stormwater ponds, um, historically, the districts really were left to their own devices to come up with some mechanism in order to develop their inventory, to manage their, their assets, so that they can comply with the various regulatory requirements in the state of Florida, whether it be the uh, state of Florida's environmental resource permit, which is managed by the local water management districts, or whether it's um, a part of the MS4 permit. Uh, DOT actually manages, I think, over 32 separate uh, phase one and phase two MS4 permits in the state of Florida. They're actually the largest MS4 permittee in the state of Florida. And, um, you'll see why that matters. Because like I said, this whole program is designed, um, SAMS is designed to help manage and make that uh, their MS4 compliance consistent. So the historic approach, 
again, you had a variety of different databases, you know, Windows database, Access database. Uh, some districts had a SQL Server database. Some actually had migrated uh, to GIS. Some districts actually just had uh, very complex Excel uh, tables uh, to track and uh, manage their, their inventory. When it comes to the inspection of their ponds and the reporting, uh, as you can imagine, um, eight decentralized districts uh, had eight very distinct and different ways of inspecting their, 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 their ponds and, and managing their stormwater assets. Um, so you can see here, uh, in terms of the information tracked, you're looking primarily uh, at the aesthetics, you know, erosion condition, the hydrologic recovery of the system, uh, structural uh, integrity, the vegetation, and the quality of the water. In terms of the inspection rating, it varied from a good, fair, poor to a numbering system of, you know, one through five or one through ten. Um, you know, pretty consistent. It wasn't too difficult to kind of merge that in. Um, but then the delivery process for delivering data, delivering inspections and maintenance records um, certainly varied, you know, from uh, emailing PDF reports to burning them to CDs and then sending them uh, intermail to the respective operations yard um, to, you know, just straight email, um, you know, the documents. So a variety of ways that this information was being delivered from the inspection staff to um, the NPDES coordinators, to the maintenance and operations uh, staff. So SAMS um, evolved, um, give you a little bit of background on the SAMS project and, and its goals. And, and SAMS evolved uh, as a part of what FDOT has recently um, been implementing, is called their e-maintenance initiative. DOT has a lot of infrastructure, a lot of assets from, you know, stormwater ponds to inlets to road striping to lighting and guardrails and, you know, uh, you name it. There, there's a gazillion things on a roadway that they have to track and, and inventory and maintain. Um, they have a lot of databases that were built in the 70s and early 80s. And I like to call them, you know, they're, do, they're 2D databases. You know, there is no geographic uh, linkage to any of it. So you can't really map it on a map um, very easily. So e-maintenance is this initiative to convert a lot of their assets and their inventories to a GIS-based system so that it can be visually represented um, on a map. So DOT uh, invested in with Esri's ArcGIS um, software. And their goals were, again, to create a GIS-based statewide asset management system to develop some statewide consistency across all the eight districts, and also to help uh, ensure that their MS4 program and the compliance of that program is consistent. So a little bit about the background of the database system and, and, and its protocols. So as, um, as I mentioned, this is an ArcGIS system. We utilize uh, ArcGIS's collector and their web map applications with the goal of you know, using those to collect data and to provide data visualization. We also coupled the database with a SQL Server database in the Microsoft Azure Cloud environment. Um, for those of you who work with Esri, their reporting uh, tools and reporting capabilities are, are limited um, in some ways. And so we wanted to be able to, to get the data out of the database in a form and a format that met the end user's need, right? Um, that databases are great, um, but if you can't get the data out in a, in a, in a useful manner or in an easy manner, um, it, 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 the end user kind of suffers. And so we really went into this with the idea of we really need to, um, for annual reporting purposes, um, for, for generating work uh, maintenance needs and, and inspection reports, we needed a little bit more um, flexibility and, and reporting capability that Esri's you know, base platform just didn't provide. So again, we coupled it with this SQL Server uh, database. And it's, uh, I'll show you some of the example reports um, at the end of the presentation. So SAM's uh, assets and timelines, this is an, uh, basically a schedule for the rollout of SAM's. Um, again, our focus uh, under the e-maintenance is on this particular component is stormwater assets. There are other assets and other timelines that have been developed. For example, there's, there's a whole different group developing um, a similar application for 
lighting inventory. And there's another group developing a similar application for tracking the guardrails and the crash cushion and, and you know, those types of assets. Um, I'm talking specifically about uh, stormwater assets. And so this is the, the, the schedule for stormwater. As you can see, we rolled out stormwater ponds in summer of 2019. Uh, asset types, you know, wet ponds, dry ponds, uh, dry retention, detention systems, you know, those are the kind of the standard systems that were rolled out. We're, the last year or so, we've been working on the linear facilities. Um, we characterize these as, you know, treatment swales, conveyance swales, canals, ditches, uh, French drain or exfiltration systems, um, and trench drains. We're actually getting ready to roll that out into the production environment to, to actually go live actually in about two weeks. Uh, so by the end of October, most of the districts um, will be using SAMs for their ponds as well as their linear facilities. And then by the summer of 2021, we uh, intend to have the stormwater outfall inventories in SAMs and out in the production environment. And then uh, by uh, summer of 2023, the goal is to bring in the inlets, catch basins, grates, manholes, pipes, and culverts. So for SAMs, there were four main applications that were developed. Um, there's the editor tool, there's an inspection tool, there's a QAQC tool, and then there's a viewer slash reporting tool. And I'll give you just a little bit of overview of each one of these. Um, the editor tool utilizes the ArcGIS collector application, primarily designed to function on the user's desktop. This is where new facilities are added into the database. Um, this is where uh, facility attribute data can be uh, modified or updated. Um, we also have the ability to link as-built plans to the asset so that when the, uh, the inspection teams are going out, they actually will have access to the as-built plans. Don had mentioned earlier, and so did Trey, about you know, the, the necessity of having good as-built plans so you know you know, what should this system look like in its original configuration? Are there, uh, you know, structural uh, defects that need to be corrected? Having those as built is critical to ensuring that your inspectors know what they're looking at. And so that was one of the key items with it. Um, and I'll show you, here's an example of it. So when you're in the field, you can actually link and bring up the as built plans um, for a given stormwater pond. And again, you can see the structural design. You can see that it's got a bleed down orifice. It may have a control structure with a skimmer. Um, you know, you'll be able to see the, um, all the structural components and make sure that that system is functioning as it was designed and permitted. The next tool is the inspection tool. Again, this also uses the ArcGIS collector application. Um, however, it was really designed primarily for the tablet and or smartphone. Uh, for those who have used Collector, you, um, you're probably familiar that there's a desktop version and a mobile version. Um, the, the, the inspection tool is really designed for the field staff to go out in the field, collect inspections, um, you know, to provide a condition assessment of the stormwater system. Um, you know, does it require maintenance? And if so, they can take photos, they can document the, the, the system, um, they can um, mark on the photos if they want to, to say, hey, this is the part that needs to be repaired. They can identify all that information. And we actually uh, created, uh, to talk about consistency, I'm gonna, hopefully this pops up, good. We created a standard operating procedure that we actually linked into the inspection tool. So as an inspector is in the field, if they have a question on how to rate something, they have a go by or this SOP that they can easily pull up on their tablet or mobile device and get a refreshment on, on okay, what constitutes something that is good, fair, and poor. And I guess I should back up. When I mentioned earlier the historic um, process where the, the eight, you know, decentralized districts really had their own inspection procedure, we when we developed SAMs, we actually created a standard inspection form and a standard inspection uh, ranking parameter. So we, you know, we look at the same thing. Every district is looking at the same thing, you know, the structural rating, the water condition, vegetation rating, so on and so forth. And we're also using a standard um, ranking metric of good, fair, and poor. 
Um, so again, this can this make sure that the inspection procedures are consistent throughout the state of Florida for DOT. That was a big push for this e-maintenance protocol to be consistent across the state. So again, this SOP is very useful. Again, helps you kind of understand um, when something and, and you know what what condition that something you may see falls into when you're doing your inspection. The inspection tool also helps with other components on the MS4 side, such as identifying illicit discharges and connections. There's a, there's an ability to kind of document, um, you know, yes or no, I'm seeing some illicit connection. Again, that ties into MS4 compliance. <clears throat> the third tool is the QAQC tool. Um, again, this also uses the ArcGIS collector uh, desktop application. Because the way SAMS was devised, um, you know, when you're in the field performing compliance inspections or developing a maintenance needs record, when you're in the field, you can hit submit on the report. And because it's a cloud-based application, that report is gone, right? You, you've hit submit, the report is out there, it's in the database. The department really wanted to make sure that there was some mechanism to ensure that someone had an opportunity to do a QAQC review on that report to make sure that it was valid. Um, I'll show you in a little bit, I mean, DOT's got thousands of stormwater ponds. You wanna make sure that the status and the comments related to those ponds are valid. So we built this QAQC tool that gives, um, it's limited access, meaning the DOT districts get to assign who they want to be the QAQC reviewer. Typically it's one of the engineers in, at the respective office. Um, and the way it works though is when I submit an inspection report, the report basically is in hold. It's in like a, basically a little purgatory, so to speak, until the QAQC uh, review is completed. So uh, this is the mechanism to ensure the reports are valid and, and uh, accurate before they go out and, and are live. And so um, that's what the QAQC tool is. What it does, it'll actually show up as a red icon on their application. And uh, that tells the QAQC reviewer, hey, I got a bunch of reports I need to go in and review. They go do the review. And once they click submit and they pass the report, it releases that report or that maintenance record to the rest of the database and allows it to be uh, accessible by everyone else. The last tool is what we call the viewer and reporting tool. Uh, it utilizes ArcGIS's web map features um, to basically provide visualization of the department's data, right? How many ponds are there? Um, right now, this is showing a visualization of where ponds that have maintenance exist, right? So you can you can visually see that there are some ponds out there um, that have maintenance. The the viewer and reporting tool, um, you can it's unlimited access, meaning that we can give it to just about any number of people. Um, the one thing that that a little bit of a confusing for some of the users. You can't make any edits or, or create any um, uh, creating new data using the viewer. It's just for visualizing and accessing the reporting tool. And with that, the report the reporting uh, tool um, is is again that's kind of like the central portal where the district uh, staff can go in and access the data. As I'd mentioned, we we use that SQL Server to kind of couple with the GIS data. This is the main portal. The viewer is the main portal to get to these reports so that they can extract the data. How many ponds do I have in this on this state road? How many ponds do I have in this county? Um, how many ponds do I have coming up for inspection in the next six months or the next year? That's what this reporting tool uh, function gives them um, access to. And I'll show you a, a few of the, um, the summary reports and the data dashboard here in just a second. So this is the data dashboard. Um, it is configurable right now. You can come in here and you can say, hey, I wanna look at district one data or I wanna look at district three data. You can select from the drop down menu which district you wanna look at and it'll update just for that district. For purpose of this presentation, I selected the statewide data just to kind of give you a gauge of the number of ponds that DOT, uh, FDOT is managing. There's a little over 5,500 ponds in the inventory um, about a little over 7,000 acres of, of, you know, that footprint acreage. Um, and this gives you a little bit of a running tally of how many ponds are due for inspection in the next 12 months, next six months, and then within the next, uh, within the next um, month. 
And then this is just a historic two year running um, tally of how many ponds have been inspected. Uh, and then this is uh, the opposite. This is a running tally of how many ponds that need to be inspected in the next two year window. Um, again, this is just a, a, a quick data dashboard that is a quick snapshot for the districts or from a statewide perspective. When the linear assets roll out, this data dashboard will be updated to incorporate some of the linear assets as well. You know, um, same thing, how many um, linear feet of, you know, treatment swales are in the inventory. So th this is going to change um, significantly, but um, it just shows you some of the capabilities that gives the districts um, access to their data. This is just a quick summary report um, that when if you if, when we met with the districts and said, hey, what are your current reporting functionalities? Again, some of them had access to reports. Some of them did not. Some of them really struggled to extract data out of their databases because the database wasn't really designed to generate summary reports. It's great for putting data in, not so good at pulling data out. So we really did spend a lot of time working with the districts and their staff to generate reports that met their needs. One of the questions we got a lot was, I really struggled to get an inventory of all my ponds by a given county. Um, I either get the entire district inventory or I, you know, I don't get a complete list. And so we built some functionality with some drop down menus where the districts can select which county they want, run the report. They can select their entire district and run the report for that. And, you know, just a, a quick summary report tells you which county you're in, gives you some asset, you know, specific IDs, um, you know, what state road it's on, the type of facility is, wet pond, dry pond, when was it last inspected, you know, so on and so forth. In terms of a project status, um, so PONS has been in effect for one year, again, a little bit over a year, actually. It was deployed in July of 2019. And based on uh, uh, the use over that last year, we're seeing about a 20 to 30% reduction in inspection costs when you compare it to the cost of the district inspecting um, their facilities using their old approach. Their old approach in many instances consisted of folks going out there with uh, notepads and a camera, you know, taking field notes in a, in a you know, with a, with a standard form and a camera and then having to come back to their office and manually plugging all that data into um, their database. Well, now they can take the photos, they can take the, uh, using the standardized template and the form that's in the collector application, all of that stuff can be done in the field, which eliminates that need to come back and have to try to remember all the details while you're in the field. So again, we're seeing about a 20 to 30% reduction in uh, the cost of those inspections. Again, that's just one year's worth of example, um, but it's, it's, it's showing that it's um, been pretty effective in, in reducing those costs. Um, well, again, I mentioned we're gonna be deploying the linear assets in October and one of the big things is it significantly increased access of the stormwater data to DOT staff. There's a lot of DOT staff that rely on these this pond data. And historically, you know, a handful of people had access to it because they're the ones who manage that one particular database. Because of this has been deployed as a cloud-based application, you know, we can give the viewer to just about any DOT employee, their consultants, their contractors, um, and we're giving them access to all of this information. Um, that is one of the biggest uh, benefits uh, that we're seeing as well. And then again, it has standardized the facility inspection process and also standardized some of the uh, MS4 annual reporting uh, process and how that data is, um, is captured and reported. And um, I'll, I'll show you just a couple, I, I know I'm gonna get close to my time, but I'll show you a couple of these reports. I think this one, for anyone who does MS4 reporting, um, you know, you have to generate a, a summary of well, what, 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 what's in your pond inventory, how many structures do you have, how many were inspected, um, and then you got to have your, your backup, right? It's like your taxes. you got to have your backup. So it automatically generates the backup record. And these blue hyperlinks, if you go to get audited by EPA or you get an audit by, um, in Florida, um, we have the Department of Environmental Protection who manages the, um, the MPDS program. You can actually click on these blue hyperlinks and it actually drills down to the specific inspection report that, that you know, documents that this inspection had occurred. 
and um, I'll show you. This is um, so. This is a facility report. Has all the attribute information associated with the pond. It auto generates a location map for you. You don't have to create your own location map. It automatically does it, and then it gives you basically a historic overview of the the um, the pond. So in in DO, or in um, Florida, the local water manager districts. Um, primarily set the inspection frequency, and it's usually once every 24 months. It's the most stringent one. And you can see this pond's been inspected every two years since 2012. You can click on these uh, links, and it'll take you to the actual report, and it'll show you that, hey, this one actually has some minor uh, vegetation growth that need to be removed from the control structure. Um, so it, it gives you that, that, uh, that overview. And then I'll, I'll just show you a facility report. This is the standard inspection form. Again, some attribute information. And again, the standard uh, parameters and the uh, re standard results and some comments. Document whether there were illicit connections or discharges or safety issues, and then whether maintenance were needed or not. An overview of the pond itself. You know, I have some lily pads growing in there, but otherwise the pond is in pretty good condition. And then again, just that auto-generated location map. That's kind of the standard inspection form. Prior to SAMS, these inspection forms were, they, they varied widely, um, and there was no consistency across the board. And the maintenance needs report is pretty similar, just documents where a maintenance item might be needed. And I guess with that, um, I thank you for your time. Appreciate you guys being here. And uh, Seth, I'll give it back to you. All right, thanks, Robert. Great presentation, good information. And uh, while I launch the, the last poll, I uh, wanted to ask if, uh, Randy, do you have any uh, any questions on uh, for, for Robert? Sure, I do. Um, and one is a question that I think Don asked, um, which is, what sort of training have you done um, or has the, has, has the DOT needed for this new system? That's, uh, that, that is a good question. We have done a lot of training, actually. I, um, I was actually this morning doing a little bit of that um, with folks uh, for, a very, uh, for, a, for one of the districts. So every time a new asset is rolled out, there is a, a training period. And we used to go in person. Uh, unfortunately, with COVID, we're now doing it um, uh, virtually through web meetings and teams. But every time a new asset is rolled out, we basically do, it's probably about a five or six hour training where we go to the district or we, we'll set up a training with them, bring their staff in, and we walk them through the application. The one thing we're trying to do is when we deploy new assets, like I said, we've deployed ponds, and now we're rolling out linear assets, we're trying to make the function and form mimic the previous asset in, the, in terms of the process. So they're not trying to relearn the application. They're just doing the same thing on a new asset, right? So um, that learning curve is already there. It just may, there may be some nuances that we got to educate them on, hey, this is a linear system. Uh, you have to, you know, enter it into the database a little bit different than you did with a pond. So, but lots of training. And then they also set aside a pretty healthy budget for what they refer to as the ongoing maintenance and support. So if someone has a technical issue, they contact us, we're able to go and help them and resolve whatever technical issue they may have. So they're very supportive of it. They really want to see this program and this application um, grow and become kind of integrated as a daily um, tool for all the DOT staff. Nice, thank you. Um, I had one other question for you. I mean, this is yes, an impressive program, seems to have obvious value for the permittees but all the, also for the regulator. And I'm wondering now that you've got this up and running for DOT, has there been any discussion or consideration given to the idea of extending this program and making it available to other types of MS4 permittees throughout Florida? I I don't I don't know if it the application itself would be expanded to other MS4s uh, because the design and the construct is really DOT specific. Um, it, it really molds itself to DOT's specific processes and procedures. Um, 
you could deploy it in other areas, but I think it would take some, it, it certainly would take some, uh, some modification, right, to, to, to fit like a municipal program, um, just because the way it, the, the construct is. Um, you've mentioned about the, the regulatory folks. DOT does have what's called a public viewer, which gives um, anyone, the public, you know, you, me, anyone, uh, can go and click on it. It's under their e-maintenance portal, and it basically provides you access to the to the viewer. So you can look at their inventory. You can see where the ponds exist. Um, so that, I think, has already been shared with some of the DEP folks. Um, but in terms of the overall application itself, again, it's very DOT-centric, um, and, and I, I just don't know how easily it would be to, to replicate at a municipal level. You, you really would want to just start over uh, and replicate the, the municipal's program. It, it's not an off-the-shelf plug-and-play type application, if that's kind of what you're getting at. It is not. It's really geared toward their specific processes and procedures. Hey, Robert, um, thanks for that input. I, I, you see the, uh, the responses to the poll here that uh, we asked folks uh, how familiar uh, they, that they are with the, the program of the type that you presented on. And it looks like over half have seen some examples of this, but most mm -hmm. have, you know, it was only about 13%, I think is the, the amount there, say that this is a common practice in their area and, and about a quarter say they see many examples. Do you see, um, is this surprising to you? I guess it's the same kind of question I asked Trey is, is this something that resonates with you or is since you're in this uh, in line of work? Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not surprised. I think you know when you have any large organization like a state department of transportation, you know they they don't turn as quickly um, and and aren't able to implement some of the newer technology as quickly as other uh, you know smaller uh, maybe municipal entities are. So I've seen a lot of these applications at the municipal level. Um, I, I think it just takes a little bit more time on a larger, you know, state agency level. Um, you know, DOT has been slowly working towards this. This isn't a new thing. It's just been taking a while to, to lay the foundation and get the, you know, the, 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 the applications and the, and the structure behind it. So it's, it's been something that's been in process that I know with DOT for a very long time. Um, again, I think it's just a local municipality that are a little bit more nimble. They can, they can implement some of these technologies a lot quicker. Um, because they don't have as much input. I mean, you got to figure how many, you know, eight districts, they, you know, I think there's probably several hundred people. How many new tablets do they have to purchase? Um, you know, smartphones for their, for their folks to use it. Um, getting the agreements with Esri in place. You know, those things take a lot of time because it's a much larger organization. So, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I've seen it at the municipal side, and um, I, I said I think DOT is um, always wanting to do it. It just takes a little bit longer for them, and they're now doing it. And um, I think it's been very successful so far. Great, great. Well, there's um, some questions that we have received from uh, those who have attended this, and I, and, and I encourage folks to continue to send in questions. Um, and we wanted to just address this with um, all, the, uh, all the panelists here. Um, for Don, there's uh, a couple of questions I want to ask you that are just kind of the covering some of the, the basic stuff and the experiential information you shared. The first is, um, what's the what's your perspective on on leaving trees in ponds or near ponds because um, oftentimes the outlet structures get clogged. Obviously, trees are good, but they can also those roots can also impact embankments and whatnot too. So that's the first question. And the second question is, um, you know. There's you showed a lot of uh, slides or, or pictures of well manicured kind of uh, facilities. I know that in, in I'm in the Northern Virginia, Washington DC area, and this person who asked this question must be uh, in an area that has a similar dynamic where we're seeing more of a naturalization. It's less manicured. Retrofits are trying to incorporate different types of plantings and, and retrofits and and, um, and and pond. Um, investments. So that seems to be somewhat counter to what you showed. So I was wondering if you could address those two points. And if you're talking, Don, then you are, yeah, you're, you're uh, on mute. 
you gotta um, unmute yourself. There you go. <clears throat> my wife likes to do that to me all the time. You mute <laughs> yourself, please. But uh, <laughs> trees to me are one of the best um, stormwater infrastructure you can have because of the water they uptake. But I've seen many detention ponds that um, has problem with leaves clogging up the outlet structure, limbs clogging up the outlet structure. Um, if the trees are planted on field banks, banks have been filled, they can be a large potential for problems because they can open up um, areas for the water to start eroding away. Um, they, I think they have to be maybe inspected a little more often. I love trees. Um, you know, if I had a tree here, I'd be hugging it, but, uh, uh, but trees are, are very good. They are very problematic in a detention pond uh, because of the, what they uh, can cause. They can cause a lot of uh, micro elevations where the water will stand. Um, I'd love to see trees in a detention pond if they're designed for a detention pond, if they're maintained to make sure that the water comes up it doesn't take the leaves and the limbs to the trees to the uh the, the uh, outlet structure so you know there's a lot of things you got to think about if you're going to allow trees to be in the pond or on the, the banks and uh and it may and it may be a decision that uh, that it's it's good to have them there you just need to maybe uh design that into your maintenance plan for the, for it um the other about retrofitting, um, it's a if if it's a, um, a city municipality owned, it's a lot easier to retrofit because then you're you are they require a little more maintenance. They require uh, more. You have to put a lot of money and time into it to retrofit it, and then you've got to have the, the the plan to make sure that you have people out there looking at it to, for retrofit for water quality, which we do that all the time for city owned. When I was with the city of Chattanooga, we look at all of our ponds for potential for retrofitting. If you're going to require retrofitting for private ponds, then who's going to fund it? Is there a funding, you have a user fee maybe that you can help fund it? Are you, is the, are you going to maintain it? Is the city going to maintain it? Because it is going to take a little more specialized inspection and maintenance for a retrofit than it does for a dry detention pod or is, is the owner going to be able to maintain it with the new uh, retrofit uh, so maintenance and is something uh, you really got to think about before you do any kind of retrofit if you are going to let trees so maintenance 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 um, yeah well don just real quickly to clarify the question is really focused on um the kind of well manicured detention ponds versus those that might be extended detention ponds that have a more diverse uh, land uh, planting palette or something like that, um, and maybe some, if and especially if there's some pockets, well, that might have some submerged uh, submerged wetland veg vegetation or, you know, those type of things. So it, you you showed primarily the kind of the well manicured. Do you see the other types that have a diverse planting palette and and you know something that has more than just lawns you know that, that that's 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 just grass i don't see a lot of it because most of the detention ponds in tennessee where i, I deal with are, are put in just for stormwater control for flooding uh okay. we don't you, they don't use them a lot for water quality and so um i love um more diverse plantings they're harder to maintain. Uh, they need a, a different, like I say, different maintenance plan for it. And and the owner, if if it's going to be a private company that owns a detention pond, if they're going to put specialized planting, then they're going to have to hire a landscape company to come in and maintain it per per that planting, rather than, than come in and just mow and blow is what we call most of our landscape companies that come in. They don't know really how to maintain. So education for landscape companies is big. We started that in the city of Chattanooga to, to start a structure to maintain, to educate our landscape companies to do more than mow and blow to know what specialized planting 
inattention ponds or bottom retention are and how to maintain them. So, you know, I keep going back to maintenance because when you start putting more specialized structures, plantings in there, you're going to have to make sure that the people who maintain it know it and you have a plan and you execute that plan and you oversee that plan. So, yeah. Okay. Hope exactly. that yeah, 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 definitely. Um, and and uh, Randy, I was going to ask if you have any questions. Before I do that, though, I wanted to highlight uh, for folks on the that they can see in the screen on the slide here that we have another pond-focused event in a couple of weeks, October seventh, um, between one and three p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. If you want to attend this, there's the link there, and again, we'll send these uh, PDF of these slides out, so you should just just click at that link. I want to clarify that just get you know, registering for one of these does not register for you all all of them so that's come up a couple times so i just wanted to clarify that point so any, any randy you have any thoughts for uh, questions for anybody here well i wanted to make a quick comment because um we've had a, a couple questions from listeners on trees and trees came up in our webinar last week when we were talking about problems with ponds so we have we have a number of constructed stormwater ponds that are now 20, 30 years old or more. They're now, many of them are completely surrounded by fully grown trees. And as a result, are very well sheltered from wind. When, when the ponds were originally built, they were made to be shallow and it was thought that they would not stratify. But partly because of the sheltering, it turns out they are stratifying the lower levels are going very low in dissolved oxygen. And as a result, we're seeing phosphorus released in the sediments. So one of the potential strategies to address the problem may be to create uh, open corridors in those surrounding tree um, growth areas around the pond so that some of the wind, enough of the wind can reach the pond to help stratify. Um, so if that's, you know, if you're interested in the trees in relation to ponds, we recommend that you go back and look at last week's webinar because it's it's fascinating territory in terms of problems and phosphorus release. Good point. That's a very good point that there is, that's part of the competing interests, right? For for these things, so um, okay, so I just, I'm trying to pick off some some questions as they're coming in uh, for folks. One question came up about enforcement, and I think this is a question for everybody. Uh, the question is, you know, do you ever uh, require a retrofit, or have you ever seen a retrofit requirement, or maybe even just a pond, what we call a pond correction, um, occurring because of a reoccurring problem? associated with a pond uh, to bring it up to the current standards you guys ever seen that or experienced this that 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 you know to meet regulatory requirements um that you have to actually address some of your your pond specifically and if so how, is that a common issue or is that not a very common issue trey i'll ask you if you're since <laughs> Yeah, so so retrofitting in general is not something that we have seen um, our regulated community be hit with um, much. That that's probably the big fear is that retrofit requirements are on the horizon. Um, but as of right now, that's that is not something specifically that we've seen. How about how about with a reoccurring pro pond problem? So let's say it's it's you know you you highlighted and Don did a great job of highlighting. Here are some ways ways that it's not functioning, right? It's the health is not good, and therefore you have to what work what we are referring to in the context of these webinars as pond corrections. So that's not a retrofit. I I, I they use the word retrofit. I use I should have used the word correction to say mm -hmm. here's a problem with the pond. We need to take an action to correct the problem. To bring it up to what a well-performing or, you know, a standard performance should be for the age and and and, and you know type of this pond, is that's what I'm talking about. So it's not about sure. I guess retrofitting to get water quality. It's more about, however, this is not function. How can we, you know, do you see a lot of that? And is and is any of that based upon enforcement action that you guys that you've seen, Trey? Yes, yeah, so I'll I'll speak quickly and then I'll be interested in the others' um, input on this because, you know, in Texas, um, there is very little um, 
of a push um, or, or what we'll say um, significant um, inspection by the regulators on the ponds themselves. They required the inspections to be done by the MS4s and you know uh, third parties, but um, there's very little follow-up and, and uh, to some degree understanding of what the expectations are even of those um, structures. So um, to the point of requiring um, specific corrective actions for non-performance, um, I have not seen that at all in you know other areas, North Carolina, Georgia, um, there's more awareness, understanding on the regulated community or regulators side of things, um, and there is more of an expectation of performance. Okay. So it really does uh, get to be regionally specific. Yeah, I'm sure of it. Robert, have you seen that in Florida or any other yeah. areas that you're active? Yeah, so in Florida, there's the uh, local water management districts that I had mentioned, and uh, they, they're a little bit more actively involved in ensuring the permitted systems are functioning as designed and permitted. Um, a couple of instances that come into mind, um, the pond was originally designed as a dry retention pond, and um, it was designed that way based on, you know, geotech, you know, borings that they had collected. However, at some point, maybe there was some type of um, artesian flow when they started excavating it. Uh, the, the system could never recover. It, it always had water standing in it. And so we uh, had to go back and basically re-permit and redesign the system to be a wet detention pond instead of a dry retention pond. Um, the dry, the, the original configuration just, it was not gonna function correctly as a dry retention system. And so that, that's one example. Um, other examples, um, more from an operation and maintenance where the control structure is constantly failing for whatever reason, you know, Florida, there's some coastal um, uh, situations, maybe there's some tide or wave action that was constantly blowing out the control uh, structure. So they had to redesign that to um, ensure that it wasn't going to co uh, continue to fail. So um, one was maintenance related, one was a design related uh, retrofit. but. To answer the, the other point was, uh, are we seeing the regulatory folks come in and mandate retrofits? I have not seen that. Um, most retrofits that, that I'm familiar with are being done voluntarily to help the permitted uh, entity either meet or exceed some TMDL obligation in a, in a basin management action plan that they're participating in. So um, they have capacity, they redesign, and they get additional treatment credit, so to speak. And, um, and those are done, again, more voluntarily to help reduce pollutant load to the um, impaired water body. Excellent. And Don, any uh, quick thoughts on this? Yes, I designed and enforced the retrofit, or not retrofit, but um, detention pond maintenance uh, program in Chattanooga that I, I oversaw for uh, about 10 years. and. We, many, many of the ponds that we would go out and do the overall inspection were allowed to be grown up. So we, we had an enforcement protocol and plans and letters. And, and that one pond I showed you with the, the, had the water standing in it and the outlet structure clogged and was maintained, was done through an enforcement uh, protocol, enforcement letters enforcement uh, inspections and they came in and and and, uh, and repaired it back to where it was designed so and we're seeing that a lot in requirements with the ms4s in uh, in uh, tennessee area and uh, and the next permit for the phase twos is going to be even more requirements for the phase twos to develop a post-construction inspection maintenance requirement to go out and look at detention ponds and make sure they're maintained and develop an enforcement response plan. And um, so that's what I'm looking for in the next permit. And so the Nashville area and Chattanooga and Knoxville and many Tennessee areas have, have been doing this for a few years now. Okay, great. Thanks. Well, now, on the, on, the, on the topic of asset management, because we did, you know, that's the focus of what we wanted to, uh, you know, we, we, it's good to talk about maintenance issues and whatever, but I also want to get, you know, covering the, the asset management approach here. And, and a question came in or a comment came in on, on last week and about 
you know, a lot of the information that we're showing is about publicly owned uh, ponds. So the question is, I've got I've got a, a two part question for 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 you guys. Trey, I'll start with you. Um, do you and this this ties in with one of our questions anyway. Um, first of all, do you see a difference in public versus privately owned um, and asset management? You know, you talk about the asset management approach that you use. Is that only applicable for um, publicly owned, or is that for privately owned? And and if not, how do you deal with those differences? So that's one question. The second question is, what's the future of asset management for stormwater and and, and ponds as well? So that's the two part question for each of you. So Trey, you want to kick us off? Okay. Yeah. So quickly on um, the public versus private, um, it, it's something that we work with entities quite a bit on this challenge because um, it's clear and easy to say if it's publicly owned, um, then you know, uh, yeah, that's that's in our purview. We're going to take care of it um, and be responsible for it. Um, but there's often an expectation, whether it's a stormwater pond, creek, you know, um, you know, otherwise, if there's private infrastructure on private property and there's no public easement, um, then um, it's much dicier um, for to spend public funds on private property. Um, and so the clean answer is to say you don't do that. Um, but the reality is politically, sometimes there's an expectation for that. And sometimes practically, there's a benefit for to the public system to spend money on private property. Um, and so that's something to to work through that uh, you know that logic of yes it's on private property but will investing public dollars in that resource um, benefit the public system and so there's an argument to be made uh, that that be the case um, we we do work through that and from an asset management um, perspective you know use that as part of the prioritization um, of of where to focus the investments. Um, your second question was about where is stormwater asset management going? Um, what we're seeing rapidly is one, an awareness by um, elected officials, by um, executives um, that stormwater infrastructure is infrastructure just like you know their water system, their wastewater system, their roadway system, that they've been making these investment decisions for um, for years and other types of you know, facilities, um, but recognizing now that stormwater is a component of that. Stormwater often gets forgotten because if it's not raining, you're not using it, um, and it's not a problem until it rains, and then there, you see, you know, a, big problems. There's peak, there's a, that's right. There's two peak flows. There's there's a peak of the storm, and then there's the delayed peak of the funding. You know, for it, they both. Just <laughs> about the same. Uh, I like that. Is that attenuation then? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of attenuation for funding. Um, so, uh, you know, having, um, as with anything, having a, some steady funding um, to steadily take care of your infrastructure ends up having a lower long term cost to the system. Um, and so, asset management is a, you know, is a cost effective approach to looking at. Um, how do we, over the long term, um, lower our costs and our risks um, to the system? There's also a need as more and more entities are looking at, um, well, I've got these stormwater issues, I've got these roadway issues, you know, let's not treat them separately and in a vacuum. It's it maybe not as much for ponds, but say for pipe systems, you know, that um, we need some coordination between these to get the, the best bang um, for the buck. Um, and, and lastly, with it, as um, leadership, um, and you know, elected officials, we're seeing more and more of an expectation of business justification you know, for investment decisions. It helps to provide that objective, um, fact-based um, evaluation based off of what's important for um, the community, um, then here's the options for you. And so I have, there's another graphic I've got that if you think about from an asset management standpoint, you know, your stakeholders, the elected officials, executive, and really even the community to degree, uh, regulators, they identify the policies, the expectations for you. From an asset management perspective, you provide the options and the risks and the cost for that. And that's that continuous cycle um, that you work with. Okay. Great, and and we're trying to. Last week we went a couple of minutes over. I, I think it's it's best for us to try to stay close to on time, uh, Randy. So uh, Robert and 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 uh, Don uh, and Randy, 
and the real Randy. Do you guys want to provide some closing <laughs> thoughts and maybe you know on the topic of asset management too? So uh, Robert, if you can if you can go. Sure, I, I'll just give a quick perspective from like Florida. So uh, Trey had mentioned it, it doesn't rain all that much in Texas, but it rains pretty much all the time in Florida. So we we have too much water um, in, in, in some instances. And so I think uh, from my experience, you know, folks are looking at stormwater management systems um, really as an opportunity, again, as to how they were really designed to provide um, pollutant abatement and prevent impacts to our receiving waters. Um, so I think there's been, uh, at least recently, I seem to be uh, getting a sense that there's a resurgence in more maintenance, right? Uh, if the system's not functioning as it was intended, you need to maintain it. So I think we're getting at that age where these ponds are aging. They need, people are starting to look at them and say, we got to maintain these systems. And so I agree. I think there's going to be a, there seems to be a refocus on maintaining the systems um, so that they are providing the pollutant abatement that um, that they were intended to provide. Um, so I, that's that's where I'm seeing it. Again, particularly related to impaired waters. Um, you know, Florida has a pretty robust TMDL and BMAP program, and so um, we're able to identify some of those problem areas. Excellent. Thanks, Robert. And Don, any more closing thoughts on on this? Uh, the question of asset quick, management. We talk about um, stormwater asset management. Where is it going? Um, especially in the southeast we're getting um what we call climate change whatever is causing that we need to maybe look at upgrading a lot of our specs for our, for new uh, pipes put in you know uh, we're seeing you know larger rain events more intense rain events whatever it's causing so that can be really a risk management asset management decision to make you know are you going to upgrade larger pipe systems in your system because of, of flooding and look at your look at a level cost cost of service of what you're doing we did that in chattanooga we decided that chattanooga is going to take over the res the single family residential ponds because of what trey was talking about you know it's part of our stormwater system it's part of the city's you know uh system so that's in the process of doing so that's a, a risk management it's, that's all I got to say. <laughs> well, I will just say that we uh, we covered a little bit in the climate change and changing precipitation patterns a little bit last week, and that is something that we need to look at non-stationarity in our design and and thinking about the future of our system. So that's a that's a really good point. And I'm Don Green. I'm not Randy. <laughs> <laughs> you should write down a piece of paper and hold it up. Sorry. That's Randy. Which first Randy's over there. <laughs> well, it depends on which Hollywood Squares has how you have it set up. For those who remember Hollywood Squares, so, um, so the real Randy, you, do you want to close this out and then we'll be done? Sure. Um, well, and I was going to close out the entire webinar, if I may, Seth, because exactly. I think exactly. it's, I think it's time. Um, yep. So uh, we really want to thank uh, Don and Trey and Robert. We appreciate your presentations. They were terrific. And the discussion. Yes, there it is. Don Green. Thanks, Don. Don't <laughs> confuse him with a guy with a beard. Um, I also want to thank Seth. Um, all the technology worked today. So you must hey. be doing something right, Seth. It's a You're wonderful thing. The blind finds the acorn sometimes, right? So. <laughs> and of course, uh, thank you to everyone for attending and participating with good questions. We hope that you uh, follow up and continue and offer your opinions and feedback, both on what you heard today and on the handout material, the much more specific uh, material on the on the decision framework that we're offering. Uh, we encourage everybody to join us again on October 7th and also look at last week's webinar on the pond problems, which was really interesting material. So thanks to everyone. Um, stay safe and we'll see you next time. We will see you next time, indeed. And we will send out information about the next, uh, this, this link. And there's been several questions about this. So we'll send all this information out to you guys. Don't worry about that. Now that we got your info, you're going to hear from us. So thanks a lot, everybody, and be safe, like, like Randy said. Have a good day. <laughs>